Good morning, church. Well, I think there's, I'm the fourth person to say good morning, so I don't know if, if some of you need that, but we're going to make it hard for you to have a bad morning. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm excited about our series in 1 Peter starting today. A character in the midst of crisis. I think we would all agree that these are some strange times, eh? I mean, you can sense the edginess when you're out in public. You can sense the frustration. You can sense the fear and apprehension. Uh, just a lot of strange things. I hear people kind of, you know, in line getting impatient or somebody getting asked like at, at Lowe's, you know, they came in through the exit and uh, the, the clerk just reminded them, this is an exit. You know, you have to come through the other way. And guy copped an attitude, you know, and, and said, I'm not a child, you know, and I'm thinking, well, actually, yeah, you are trapped in a 50 year old body here. So these are strange, tr strange times. I'm driving to work today. I'm listening to an audible on book in, in the middle of the book as I'm just, you know, listening. All of a sudden a voice comes on and says, now switching to foreign language. I'm thinking, what does that mean? I mean, and I got my hands on the steering wheel, 10 and 2, because that's how old people drive. And uh, this voice comes on and then my book switched into French. I don't speak French, but I'm listening to a book in French for about 10, 15 seconds, and then it went back to English. Strange times. So we're going to dive into 1 Peter, character in the midst of crisis. How do we live as people of substance in trying times? How do we, as the people of God, exercise our faith in the middle of hostility? You know, 1 Peter is about keeping hope and endurance in the midst of suffering. Now, suffering is laced throughout the first five chapters. Fifteen times, you know, he refers to suffering. In the original Greek, he uses eight different Greek um, words to describe suffering. Um, so this is, you know, this is, this is a great book. Now, I will say this is a high challenge book. Uh, this, is a, this is an epistle or a letter that is going to challenge spiritual passivity. You know, you think about it. Uh, this is written just a few short years before Nero would uh, persecute, would set part of Rome on fire, um, you know, where all kinds of hell would break loose. Uh, Christians were characterized as, as very weird people, as very strange people. He would accuse them and blame them of setting the fires. You know, the, the rumors were circulating that these, you know, uh, Christians practiced cannibalism because there was mention of communion, you know, eating the flesh, drinking the blood. So they, they're, ca you know, they're, they're cannibals. Um, they met in catacombs. A lot of, a lot of Christians met in you know, graveyards and tunnels. Um, you know, they talked about fires of judgment. Um, you know, so they, these Christians got a bad rap and they were persecuted. And I love the fact that Peter comes and tells them, tells us, how do we live in the midst of these kinds of times? Suffering times, trying times, persecuting times. And so let's just go ahead and dive in in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. If you have a Bible, you can open it. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You know, this is the five provinces, which would be modern Turkey right now. To the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the spirit of obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, so he's addressing people that really don't have stable, stable dwelling places. They're not people, you know, that are rooted and grounded geographically. These are people that are scattered all over. You know, different brands of persecution have come. Uh, they're they're kind of on the run a little bit. They're nomadic. And they're referred to, you know, in 1 Peter as aliens, pilgrims, sojourners. People that don't really have a home. They're people on the move. They're people that are just passing through in a foreign land. But I want you to see something that he says, the foreknowledge of God, the father and the sanctification or the consecration, the set apartness of the spirit in obedience by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what you see there right off the bat in the first couple of verses is that the Trinity, the father, son and the Holy Spirit are at work in the church, are at work in the life of the believer, regardless of how hard times are. So this is a this serves as a great reminder for us. That the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity of God, is actively at work and alive in us. I think it's interesting that Peter is going to do some reminding here. You know, the first words, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is a reminder of who he is. When he uses the word, his name, an apostle, he's reminding his audience and the future readers who he is important he's reminding them who he is and also in that sentence it's laced with 
who he used to be and who he's not anymore. You see, Peter at this point is an empowered apostle, a messenger, a sent forth one with authority from Jesus Christ himself. He's not the guy that was sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's not the one that was denying Jesus. He's now not the one that, who cursed that he even knew Jesus. He's not the one that made promises that he couldn't fulfill. No, he's new. He's not just new and improved. He has a new identity that was given to him by Jesus Christ himself. So right off the bat, Peter reminds the people who he is and who he's not. He also reminds the people who they are, the elect, God's people, God's chosen people. Seven times in five verses or five chapters, he's going to remind them about their identity as the body of Christ, who they are as the people of God. In fact, if you just go over to chapter 2, verse 9, you'll see these famous words. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Identity. We're going to be talking about identity. They're God's people. Even though they feel weak, even though they're scattered, I love that Peter is empowering them with the knowledge and revelation that they weren't, were not a people, but now they are the people of God. Think about that. He also reminds them who their God is. The eternal Father. Both paternal and powerful. I love those reminders. And then he says, grace and peace be multiplied. Grace is found in every chapter. Five chapters, grace is in every chapter. What is, what is, what is grace? We hear that word a lot. It's the, it's the benevolence and it's the generosity of God to needy people. He says grace and peace be multiplied. The shalom of God. The absence of turmoil internally. The non-circumstantial peace where everything outside of you can be going crazy, but then there's the subtle peace of God internally in your heart. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, once again, l listen to the descriptors there, not just mercy, abundant mercy. What is that? It's compassion and action. Mercy is the active desire to remove distress. When people cried out to Jesus, they would say, have mercy on us. What were they saying? Do something about the condition that we're in. Bring freedom, bring deliverance, bring hope, bring healing. That's what mercy is. Mercy is a powerful word. Abundant mercy. And he's begotten us again to a living hope. Man, Peter is referred to as the apostle of hope. The Apostle Paul is referred to as the Apostle of Faith. The Apostle John is the Apostle of Love. But Peter is the Apostle of Hope. And I love the fact that it's just not hope as a concept. It's a living hope. And that's what we have. And that's how he starts this letter. How does that hope come? Through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is alive because Jesus is alive. If Jesus hasn't resurrected from the dead, we have no hope. And like the Apostle Paul would say in Corinthians, we of all men are to be most pitied that our faith is in vain. But it's not because Jesus is alive. His hope is alive and he's living by the Spirit of God in us. You see, we don't work for this hope. It's a divine birthright. We're begotten, it says. We're begotten. We're born into this. It's the language of the new birth. It's the language of new creation. That's what's going on in us. It's anchored in the resurrection it's not anchored in the news. It's not anchored in the government. It's not anchored in politics. It's not anchored in the next election. It's not really anchored in the hope of getting a vaccine or curing this or, you know, opening everything back up. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not rooted in the latest conspiracy theories, what may be true, what not might be true. No, no, no. This hope is anchored and set in us by the Spirit of God. The living hope that the Apostle Peter is talking about here is the abiding witness that you and I will never go through anything, no matter how bad it gets, all by ourselves. Scripture also says Christ in us is the hope of glory. That is our hope. That's what, what we're banking on. C.S. Lewis said this. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or mere wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do, it does not mean that we are to leave this present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were those who thought of the next world the most. 
Wow. What else does he say? To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Who you are in Christ and what you have in the form of an inheritance can never be taken away, can never be tarnished, can never fade, and can never corrode. Why? Because it's eternal. It's rooted in the heavenlies. It's by the Spirit of God. See, everything, I think we would agree, is perishable. Our bodies are perishable. Look in the, look in the mirror. As the years go by, there's a perishable body. Your titles, your positions, your accomplishments, your education, your business, everything that you have ultimately outside of the kingdom of God is perishable. It's fading away. Say bye-bye. It's over. Grasp on to the kingdom realities. The words of the truth are the words of hope that we're embracing right now. Not putting our hope in our bank accounts, our 401k. That doesn't mean we're not responsible in our stewardship. Of course we are. But we're not banking on it. We're not just living. You know, I have hope if the stock market goes up, my stocks are doing good. That's where my hope is. No, 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 no. Everything is perishable. Everything is fading away. You know, the good news is your suffering, my suffering, whatever it is, isn't going to last forever. It's all temporal. That's what actually Peter is doing right here. He's drawing our ten attention away from the natural, away from the temporal, away from the circumstantial. And he's pointing us to the future eternal. That's why our eyes are supposed to be fixed on that, on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not everything that we see down here horizontally. Our worship is rooted upwards, not horizontally. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse 6, in this you, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials or distresses, uneasiness or, or sorrow. So he acknowledges, but it's almost like he's not giving the weight to suffering that you would think. He may be minimizing it a little bit, but he's more important in, in the character that you and I have and walk in in the midst of it. Not trying to shield us from it. So I just want to give you two thoughts because if you've been around me long, I get two good thoughts a week and these are my two thoughts. Here's the first one about growing in character. Don't confuse suffering with inconvenience. There's a high challenge statement right there. Don't confuse suffering with inconvenience. You not being able to go to your favorite restaurant is not suffering. You not being able to hang out with your friends at the coffee shop is not suffering. You having to wear a mask is not suffering. I'm sorry. You having to stand in line six feet apart is not suffering. You being without a little toilet paper. Okay, well, wait, maybe I'll give you that one. That could be suffering. But all these things, they're inconveniences. Wearing a mask, sheltering in place. It's not suffering. Don't give it that label. It's inconvenient. Last year, there was 3,000 Christians killed for their faith around the world. That's suffering. 10,000 church, churches and or Christian buildings around the world were attacked. That's suffering. I read about a place in a country that I've gone to and that I'm going back to, and a segment or a province in that country was talking about the Christians are such a minority and they're so persecuted. Women get raped. Churches get assaulted. And the suicide rate amongst Christians is high because they can't take it anymore. That's suffering. Don't confuse suffering with inconvenience. In fact, I would challenge you, okay, I know it's early, but download the app Open Doors. You can get a play-by-play -play around the world of current suffering and persecution. I would challenge you to download that app, get the updates, and see who you can pray for, people that you have never met, probably never will be, never will meet except in heaven, but desperately need your prayers and the plight that they're going through. Verse seven, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believing 
you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So during this quarantine, let me ask you, how's your faith? How is your faith right now? Is it active? Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it growing? Is it lethargic? Is it risk-taking? Is it reaching out? Is it anemic and languid? What, what is the condition of your faith in your heart? Now, we know that throughout the New Testament, you see faith used, I think it's over 200 times. And it refers to faith as something that can grow, something that can shrink, something that can be big, something that can be small, growing. How's your faith? Where are you at right now? Here's the second thought about growing in character. Don't coddle weakness. Work it out. Don't coddle weakness. Work it out. Peter doesn't. When you read these five chapters, and I would encourage you, go read them. You won't see. You will see a little sympathy and a little empathy, but he, he's not about that. He doesn't coddle people's weakness. He calls them up. He calls them out of it. And he equip, equips them on how to live as equipped saints and sons and daughters of God. You see, Peter's message you'll get when you read is not about survival. It's not about hanging on till Jesus comes back. You know, we just got to make it through this life. No, 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 no. Very strong, very high challenge letter. In fact, I think there's an echo of 2 Timothy chapter 4. You, brothers, exercise yourselves to godliness. I love the word exercise there. It's gymnasio in the Greek. It's where we get the, the, the term gymnasium. What happens in a gym? A lot of working out, a lot of sweat. A lot of pain, a lot of exertion. And that's what's happening here. See, we're not trying to earn. Don't make the mistake. We're not trying to earn something from God. We are working out to put ourselves in a place where we can abide with him to receive and be empowered to the degree that he wants us that way. And that includes working out. Go to the spiritual gym. Grow. Grow. Make a decision to grow. This is what I know. I've been being around sports my whole life, seeing people that have worked out, seeing people that couldn't run a mile, finish a marathon, people that couldn't lift a barbell over their head, start working out. This is what I know. Every work weak person physically and spiritually can work out and can get stronger. They just can. Will they? It depends what you do. It depends on what I do. Don't be afraid to sweat. Don't be afraid to labor. It's by grace that we do these things. He helps us in the workout. Romans 15 verse 1 says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Weak people can't strengthen weak people any more than the blind can lead the blind. Strong people help weak people. Now, let me just say, if you're feeling kind of weak and anemic, don't feel condemned. That's not what this is about. This is about calling you and me up to a higher level of grace in God. You know, you go through Peter, and I'll close with this. You go through Peter, these five chapters, and like I said earlier, he, he is challenging, man. He is, he is going after spiritual passivity. I mean, here's just a few things that he'll say in these five chapters as we unpack it. Confront sin in your own life. Be holy. Be sober. Be aware there's demonic forces out there. He doesn't say cower from them. He says, you know, take a look around, man. A lot of what you see going on, a lot of the killing, stealing, destroying, failures. It's just not people having a bad natural day. There are spiritual forces at work behind it. He says, don't be idle. He says, do good works. He says, keep your mouth in check. He talks about maturity being people that know how to control their tongue. He says, watch your lifestyle, how you're living, because there's people that don't know God that are watching you and you're influencing all the time. So don't let spiritual passivity rule the day and ruin your life. Tests and trials and hardships 
and suffering help us grow. Hard to live with, but maturity is impossible without them. And hey, let me just say, okay, I'll just tell you this in all transparency. I don't want to go through it any more than you do. I'd rather read the book, How to Be Mature in God. Drink a latte, sit in my hot tub, highlight a book like that. But that's now it, not how it happens, folks. So embrace it. And I want to encourage you as we go through these weeks, read through 1 Peter. You know, five chapters. Every day, read it. Listen to it. You'll grow. I want to pray for you right now. Father, first I want to pray for people that are watching and do feel weak. They just, they've been battered around. You know, they've been hit from every side. They don't have a lot to give. They're just like broken. And Lord, you tell strong people to lift them up, to sustain them and to carry them. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for them right now. And I pray that you would lift them up. I pray that you would surround them with strong people. People that know you, people that know the word, people that know how to pray, people that know how to encourage, people that know how to love. So I pray for weak people, God. Help them. And I pray for strong people, God. They, they wouldn't spend all their time looking in the mirror, flexing spiritual muscles. But they would be on the lookout to what's really going on in our culture and in this world. So, Father, I bless every single person watching this today. And I pray that your kingdom would come in all its dynamism. And your will would be done for all your glory. And in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, Rock of Roseville, and anybody that watches. Love you. Have an awesome week.